And we want everybody, so we wanted to welcome everybody to It's All One Book with Rabbi and Friends. My name is Rabbi Peter Gaines, and I am going to be joined, hopefully, by my better half, Susan. Okay, hopefully she will get to us as she is uh, taking care of my four-legged child. All righty. Very good. All right. Well, um, again, typically what we do, and uh, Alethea, hopefully you can uh, uh, contribute to this if you'd like, but week after week when we get started or whenever we have a session, and by the way, you can also see us on YouTube. You had mentioned that you watch people there, but this will be on YouTube. Okay, for the benefit of those who don't get to join us on Sunday morning and or, you know, that we meet on Saturday morning as well for Totally Tasty Torah at 8.45 on Shabbat morning. Okay, so again, uh, as we start, well, let's pray. Abba, we just come before you right now. Father, we just praise you and we thank you for allowing this technology for us to come before you right now, Lord, and... Uh, to have a havara, have a, a meeting, a meeting that's all about you. So we lift you up. We ask, Lord, that through your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, that you pour into all of us. Okay, you gather us together specifically for a reason, and that uh, uh, we know that uh, you want us to be your Talmudim, your students, but you want us to be your disciples. And, uh, and, uh, so we want to be able to disciple well. And so we study the word of God, and we know probably beyond a shadow of a doubt, because you're in a, in a session run by a rabbi, that there might be Jewish people that are put in your path. And so we need to be well equipped, okay? Because um, like me, at the very beginning, I had no concept of who this Messiah was, okay? I'm Jewish. I'm not Catholic, okay? <laughs> So anyway, uh, be that as it may, I was totally uninformed, but uh, then I read the word and uh, there was a veil in front of my eyes that got lifted. So I just praise you and I thank you. Be with us as we study both Devarim, Deuteronomy and Acts as well this morning. And we praise you and we thank you for all in attendance and we lift you up in the precious name of Yeshua HaMoshiach Tzikano, Yeshua our Messiah, and our righteousness. Amen, 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 and amen. Okay, Susan is with us. Amen. All righty. Okay, so Devarim, again, uh, begins with Deuteronomy 1.1, if you want to turn there. And by the way, Alethea, the book that we normally use, the translation, is called the TLV, or the Tree of Life. And it is a direct translation from the Hebrew goes from Genesis to Revelation, but it refers to, for example, Jesus is Yeshua. Okay, all the references are, are, are many are in Hebrew, but we will go over those. But these are the words, it says, Devarim, which Moses spoke to all of Israel on the side of the Jordan in the wilderness. And as a recap, uh, the uh, this is a curtain call for Moses. This is where he wants to recap, recap everything that's happened over the last 40 years in the desert because he's about to leave us. His days are numbered. But he knows that once he leaves, that things may fall by the way. So um, he's going to reiterate almost everything that we were taught and the experiences that we had in the desert over the last 40 years. So in the readings of the book of last week, we studied the end of Numbers, Bamid Bar, last week, which concluded with a double Torah portion. Deuteronomy 1.1 is where we are. Okay, a double Torah portion last week, which was Matot and Masai. Oh, and, uh, but this week, in Devarim, with the Torah portion, it's also called Devarim, the words. 
Moses, again, details uh, the whole wilderness experience, this whole saga, if you will, and reviews with all the people everything that Adonai had ordered them. And the first directive that he gave at Horeb, which is also known as Mount Sinai, was to get moving and move into the promised land, which extends from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River. Okay. Um, I need to step aside here one moment. Okay. And uh, Susan's going to kind of take over for a minute. Okay. Uh, but look at that. Look at 1-1. One, one. And maybe Sheila, or would you like to read that? Can you unmute? Okay, and I will be back in just a moment. Okay. Okay. Okay, right. Deuteronomy 1-1. One, one. Go ahead. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan, in the wilderness, in the Arabah, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tafel, Laban, Hazarat, and Dizahab. That's it, right? Keep going. Okay. It is 11 days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seor to Kadesh Barna. Now Moses spoke to Bnei Israel according to all Adonai had commanded him for them. In the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, after he had struck down Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, king of the Bashan, who lived in Aserat and Etrei. May we continue? Yes, please. Okay, wait. Yes, yes, yes? <laughs> yes, that's yes. Okay, okay. Across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this Torah, saying, Adonai, our God, spoke to us at Horeb, saying, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn, journey on, and enter the hill country of the Amorites and all their neighbors in the Arba, the hill country, the lowland, the Negev, and by the seashore, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Enter and possess the land that Adonai swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their descendants after them. Mm -hmm. Go on. More? Yep. Okay. Bad report and poor response. I spoke to you at that time saying, I am not able to bear the burden of you by myself. I deny your God has multiplied you, and here you are today, like the stars of the heavens in number. May I deny God of your fathers increase you a thousand times as many as you are, and may he bless you just as he has promised you. How can I bear your load and burden and bickering by myself? Choose for yourselves wise and discerning men, well known to your tribes, and I will appoint them as your heads. You answered me and said, the thing you have said to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, men who were wise and well known, and appointed them as heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officials for your tribes. I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Here are cases between your brothers, and judge fairly between a man and his brother or the outsider with him. You must not show partiality in judgment. You must hear the small and the great alike. Fear no man, for the judgment is God's. The case is, is uh, too hard for you. You shall bring to me, and I will hear it. I commanded you at that time everything you should do. Then we journeyed from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as Adonai our God commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barna. I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which Adonai our God is giving to us. See, Adonai your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as Adonai and your fathers have promised you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Then all of you came near to me and said, let's send men ahead of us to explore the land for us and bring us back word about the, bring us back word about the way we should go up and the cities we will enter. The idea seemed good to me, so I took 12 men from among you, one man for each tribe. They turned and went up and went up into the hill country and they came to the Wadi Eshkol and spied it out. They took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us. They also brought back word to us and said, 
Good is the land that Adonai, Adonai our God, is giving to us. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of Adonai your God. In your tents you grumbled and said, Because Adonai hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going? Our brothers have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people are greater and taller than we are. The cities are great and fortified up to the heavens. Besides, we have even seen the children of Anakim there. Then I said to you, don't tremble or be afraid of them. Adonai, your God, who goes before you, he himself will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your own eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how Adonai, your God, carried you as a man carries his son. Everywhere you went, you came to this place. Yet for all this, you did not trust in Adonai, your God. The one who goes before you on the way to, to scout out a place for you to camp and to show you the way you should go in fire by night and then a cloud by day. When Adonai heard the tone of your words, he was angry and swore on oath, saying, not one of these men of this evil generation will see the good land that I swore to you your, to give your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Yefuna. He will see it yet to him and his children. I will give you give the land that he has walked on because he has followed Adonai wholeheartedly. Okay. Adonai, that's it? Okay. Stop right there. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's safe to say that we are all love the Lord. Okay. That's why we're here this morning. But in all this reading that Sheila did, what is the one thing that we, most of us, do not do when we, when we go about our daily business, when we go about our daily uh, ups and downs, trials, what is the one thing we don't do? Many times. We don't thank him. That's one thing. Yes, yeah, very good. We don't thank him. Um, we often don't pray. We often don't pray. That's a good one, too. But there's one thing I know, my, myself in, included, um, when things are happening, whether it's... Um, relationships or financial things or health issues what is the one thing we do not do as we should we don't always seek him first okay we don't always seek him first and when we seek him should... first yes lafuna i was saying we do not worship our worship is affected. Our worship is what? It is affected. It is affected. Okay. Well, my, the word that I'm looking for, and, and all those words were great, good answers. And my word is trust. Mm. Yeah. We just don't trust. Uh, we go through, go through these things and... We read our Bible and we pray, never as much as we should, of course, but uh, man, I tell you, that word trust is a big one. That's the big one. And that's, I'm speaking personally, that's where I fall down. I have to keep reminding myself to trust. What the heck is going on, Lord? Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my friend? Why is this happening in whatever situation? And it's the trust. And we see here that same issue where mm -hmm. Sheila was reading. Just do not trust in the Lord. You, you, you can remember all the things that he's done for you all the blessings that he's done for you, all the storms he's brought you through, the confusion he's brought you through. 
And yet when something comes up, ah, we don't trust. That's right. So I don't know if there's anyone else who wants to add to that, but that's the big one. That's the big one. Yeah, that's a big struggle. Yeah. It really is. Mm, <clears throat> agreed. But for me, it's not necessarily trust. It's what I said. It really affects my my time of worship. I am because I'm usually I will be discouraged or something like that. So I will be praying, trusting the Lord. But I know I am not at the level that. I will usually be if everything was going well. Mm hmm Okay. Except off here. Mm -hmm. about trust. Trust. Okay. What a remarkable issue. Okay. So, again, and I apologize, to take care of some business. Um, once the Israelites had reached Horeb and Mount Sinai. Uh, again, his directive at that point was to move into the Promised Land, which actually starts from the Mediterranean and goes all the way to the uh, Euphrates, including the land of uh, Ammon and Moab and Edom. But it is possible that the people who were there, now that they were out of Egypt and free from the whip, that they were quite content to just kind of hang out where they were. Once they had received ultimately the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. But they were no longer under bondage, and the easiest thing would be to content to just kind of hang in where they were. But all of us can relate to changes. How many have ever moved? Yes? Either from one city or one state to another? Yeah. Okay, packing up, moving, going through changes. We recently moved after 25 years in one area to a new area. Had to find all the, the right drugstore and the, the restaurants and everything in the area that we, that we could utilize and all the services in this new area. So it was uh, a lot of getting used to. But even the change in your life to receive Messiah Yeshua as your Lord and Savior was a big change, amen? amen. So, and it can be difficult. It can be difficult, but it takes effort to really cope with a very new situation. Life is a journey, amen? And we are not meant to stand still and stagnate in any one particular place. We're meant to move forward. So, Hebrews 13 17 says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Here, at this particular place and time, he reminds this new generation, because remember the old generation died off, but before they left Horeb, he had to create a, a system of leaders in charge of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens because of their ultimate quarrelsome nature. And it had been a really heavy burden to uh, Moses. But the leaders were commissioned to judge cases and, dispute, uh, and disputes fairly, showing no favoritism. If you recall, who was it that observed Moses trying all the cases once they were out in the wilderness? His father-in-law. Jethro. Father Jethro, otherwise known as Jethro. Okay, that was before he discovered oil and moved to Hollywood. Okay. But again, he saw that all the cases were being brought to Moses and said, you're going you're gonna to burn yourself out fast point all these leaders, they will try these cases before you, make sure that they are righteous men and showing no favoritism, but if they can't handle the case, then they'll bring it to you. 
And of course, we know the, the profound thing about Moses is what if he didn't know the answer? He went to God. He went to God. Amen? Okay, so 121 says, after they reached Kardesh Barnea, go up and take possession as Adonai, the God of your ancestors, has told you, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, liked the idea of having leaders represent them and the people approached Moses and said, would you do that for us? Okay, so ultimately, the Lord wanted scouts to go out and look at the promised land. So he chose 12 leaders of tribes to go out ahead of them and find the best way into the land. And Moses, again, appointed people from every tribe. Each one of these leaders came back saying that the land was bountiful. However, Ten of the scouts said the inhabitants were bigger and stronger than the Israelites. And the implication was that God was not big or strong enough or faithful to re to uh, or real enough to defeat them. Wow. What had he just done? What had gotten them to this point? Mm. Elisa, welcome. Glad you're here. Okay. Elisa, yeah, we're in Deuteronomy, beginning of Deuteronomy, okay, fifth book of the Torah, okay, and so, again, somebody tell me, enlighten me, give me one thing that, that the Lord had done that would be peculiar that they should act this way. He had parted the Red Sea and oh, allowed... No. did he really do that? <laughs> is, is that a fable? Okay. <laughs> He had food delivered every evening. They pick it up in the morning. Okay. I believe he even gave them those 40 year crocs that never 40 wore out. 40 year crocs or crocs. Okay. Right. And brought yeah. water out of the rock. I mean, <laughs> how much more does he have to do? You say so. He created the first Uber. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Yeah, he provided uh, the sandals, the, or as Michael said, the Crocs. Last <laughs> for 40 years, imagine that. On um, Grubhub, I, wish, I oh, should Grubhub, say. That's, what yeah, I was. that's Grubhub. And as Diane said, there was a, a rock that followed them through the entire wilderness, okay, that provided water. Unbelievable. I mean, nothing major. Okay, but still at this point, because he refers to them as what? What's the the kind words that he calls these people. Well, the, grum the grumbler word keeps going up. Don't be like the children. Grumbler. Call them the stiff-necked stiff -necked people. people. Yeah. There you go. Okay, guess what? Nothing has changed. <laughs> okay, so the Israelites chose to believe that was, they sent out 12 spies into the land Okay, and they came back, and they all had a great report, except 10 of them said that the inhabitants of the land were giants. Okay, Nephilim, if you remember, of whom Goliath was a descendant. Okay, but they, they were too strong, and there was no way that they could defeat them. Yet they came back with what? What did they bring back to show Moses and Aaron? Grapes. Grapes. Produce grapes, from the land. Big grapes. Oh, my grapes. What did you say, Pastor? Pomegranates. Pomegranates. Yeah, they were, they were so big that they had to be carried on a pole between two men on a stick. They were the size of bowling balls. Okay? But they chose to believe the faithless majority instead of the faith-filled spies who were Joshua and Kate. Okay, so the bottom line is that believing the majority report was contrary to everything they had witnessed and experienced. God had moved powerfully and miraculously on their behalf, both in Egypt and in the desert. So 
So not only that, but he had proven himself by going ahead of them and charting the way that ultimately they should go. They only had to follow. They didn't need to reinvent the wheel. Okay, they just needed to say, take charge, we'll follow you. There was no reason to think that God would bring them to the edge of the promised land only to desert them or leave them in the hot car with the windows up. In this particular parasha, Moses reminds the new generation of the devastating consequences of their parents' lack of faith. What happened to them? They, what died. Happened to them? they died in the desert. Okay, so this the only those that were 20 and younger at that particular time, okay, post when the spies came back, okay, is that they all passed away in the desert. The entire generation died like Moses will. Moses also reminds them that when their parents knew that they had sinned by listening to the 10 spies and understood the consequences of their sin, they tried to make it right by fighting the enemy in their own strength. And so they suffered a severe loss. Okay, a great defeat. Moses ultimately seems to be teaching that the majority doesn't always know what's best. Can, does something come to mind? Anybody? About majority or mob rule? Anybody? What comes to Can mind? Can you please repeat that, sir? Say again, Pastor. I was asking if you can repeat your question. Oh, the question is, we were talking about, he says that he seems to be teaching us that the majority doesn't always know what's best. Lots of times people jump in with mob rule. Okay, can you think of anything in particular currently that's going on that would suggest we have a problem with that? Mm. Hello? Anybody? No? Makes me, what's going, what's makes, going me, Michael? makes me think of the self-proclaimer, self-proclaiming protectors of democracy. Just vote for us and uh, we'll fix it all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did anybody bring to mind what's going on on the college campuses around the country? Oh. oh. Uh, Semi-tech okay. attacks. Demonstrations, pro Hamas, pro terrorists, mm -hmm. anti Israel, anti Semitic. People have no clue. They are completely uninformed about the Word of God or any of the history involved, and they simply jump in because it seems like it's cool to do that. Exactly. It is defies description, okay, and they're being led astray by evildoers, okay? That's simply the case. It's far too easy to get pulled along by the crowd, okay? And you can you don't have to look very far to look at current mob rule. We understand that although God forgives us when we repent for not following him, that we can escape the consequences, we cannot escape the consequences of our actions. Bottom line, God will not desert us, but there will be changes that we have to live with and that we have to accept once we accept him. Amen? Amen. But meanwhile, Moses gives parting words as he is not going to cross the Jordan. How come? Why isn't he going to cross the Jordan? Anybody? He disobeyed God. He did? He lost trust. How did he disobey God? By striking the rock instead of speaking to it and letting God be glorified that way. Okay. That was one thing that he did. He struck the rock twice, twice, okay, as opposed to speaking to the rock, which God had ordered him to do, to bring forth water from the rock. But at that particular time, he did something else that was even probably more 
problematic. He said we. He said we, Sheila. Okay, you think we have a problem with pronouns now? <laughs> okay. He, he used the wrong pronoun. He said we will bring forth water. Whoops. He put himself on the same level as God. Okay, God didn't let that slip. So it didn't matter how many hundreds of times Moses pleaded with God to let him cross the Jordan. Okay, God said, uh-uh. Mm -hmm. but, but we know that this is all figuratively speaking. That is to say, the promised land is, is what is the promised land that we're talking about? When we talk about the promised land, what are we referring to? Israel? Heaven. Kingdom of uh, heaven. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yep. the kingdom of heaven. Honestly. Okay, so where is Moses? Park at the restaurant. Okay, so can I have his phone tell them to text you? Okay. Hey. Mike, Mike needs to mute. Okay. Okay, so... Um, where is he now? And how do we know where he is? Do we know where he's buried? No, nobody knows where he's buried. Okay. But do we know where he is ultimately and how? He obeyed. Well, he obeyed. That's true. And as a result of his obedience, where is he now? In heaven. In heaven. How do we know that? Because he obeyed. <laughs> yeah. Did he not make an appearance? Yes, he made Where? an appearance. Yeah, Elijah and Moses with Jesus Christ. Is that what you're talking about? On the Yeshua mountain? The Messiah. Yeshua the Messiah appeared where? Yeshua the Messiah. Mount, it's Mount of Transfiguration. Yes, and okay. Who was, with him, who was with him at the time? Moses. Moses. And Elijah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Peter was rather confused at that time. Okay? He was so befuddled when he saw them. What did he do? What, 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 he asked uh, if he could make them tents. Uh, make them a, a sukkah. Okay, which is what he was born in. He was born in a sukkah during Sukkot. Okay, during the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, somewhere around September. Sukkot. Okay, the Feast of Tabernacles where they celebrated the huts that they built in the desert for 40 years. Okay, and just as a reminder for those of you who are not aware, the reason why Yeshua's mother, Miriam, was her name, and her father, Yosef, went to someplace called Bet Lechem. Translation? That's not him. House of bread. House of bread. Because he was the bread of life. Amen? Wow. Okay, so when they got there, the Holiday Inn was booked because it was Sukkot. They were celebrating. They were also there because of the census. But there was no room, so they did what everybody else did. They built a little hut. And they stayed in there, and they turned over a food storage container and placed the baby in it. And therein lies the real story. Okay? But, again, he will not desert us. We deal with changes. Again, he gives us his point, his parting words and to the children of Israel so that they will follow his mitzvot. Mitzvot in Hebrew is commandments. He also wants them to remember that their strength is in the Lord himself. It is yud he vav he. Somebody give me the translation. yud he vav he. I will continue to do whatever I got to do. Okay. <laughs> where, where do I we see that? that? Uh, say that again, Pastor. I was saying I will be what I will be. I will be what I will be. 
Okay, that's when Moses was standing before the burning bush and he asked him, Who am I? Who, what's your name? He said, Yud, He, Vav, He. We stretch that out. Okay, the contemporary believers stretch it out. And you have Yahweh. Yahweh. Okay, some people say Jehovah. Jehovah is a non word. Okay, to make no mistake. Okay, there's no such word as Jehovah. Okay, yeah, I want, I want to learn that our my tribe, the language that we speak in my tribe is Chivenda. We have the right translation. It's Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh. Okay, Yud He Vav He. His name is so holy that we can't say his name. So they he gave us the Yud, the He. These are four Hebrew letters: Yud, He, Vav He. Okay. I will be who I will be, or some translations say I am that I am. But the correct translation is I will be who I will be. In other words, don't put me in a box. I'm going to be anything I need to be in order to get your attention, like a burning bush that doesn't get consumed. Amen? Amen. Okay, so he says, it is yud he vav he whom they will follow across the Jordan and take the land, ultimately. In Deuteronomy 1, 30 through 31, it says, the Lord your God, well, even before I say that, there's uh, a proverb that comes to mind. Proverb that comes to mind indicating who's in charge. It starts, in all thy ways. Acknowledge him. Proverbs 3, 6. Him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Okay, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Lean not to thine own understanding, it says. Okay? Everybody tries to do things your own way. But we need to look to him to allow him to direct our path. So Deuteronomy 31, 30, verses 30 and 31 says, The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. If he did all that, why do we need to reinvent the wheel? All we got to do is plug in. Okay, again, if you know somebody is successful in business and you're opening a business and trying to run your business, would it not be a good idea to follow what that predecessor that you've been looking at did so that you can avoid the pitfalls that we always make out when we make our own decisions? Diane's going, yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> been there, done that. Yeah. Likewise, Adonai, Lord, ordains a season of change for us, and we can trust him and confidently move forward. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Okay. It goes into a lot of detail about specifically in the rest of Deuteronomy about traveling from place to place and all details, all the things that happen along the way. Do you remember this and what happened? Do you remember this and what happened? Do you remember this and what happened? Okay, what does that sound like? Anybody have or makes me think of another book? When the Lord said, did you do this? I did. Genesis. Job. Job. Oh, Job, yeah. Yeah, book of Job. After all is said and done and the Job and his, uh, his friends have been ranting and he, pointing fingers at Job, the Lord steps in. Mm. And, and as this rabbi likes to say, he shucked it down to the cob. Made it very clear who was in charge. That's why a lot of people believe that Job was the first book of the Bible ever written. Wow. Okay. Okay. Next week, the parasha is uh, Deuteronomy 3, starting with verse 23. <clears throat> you may want to make a note of that. Parasha is called Ve'et Hanan. Ve'et Hanan. Okay, which means, and he pleaded. Who pleaded? 
We just mentioned it a minute ago. Who was pleading? Moses. Moses. Can you get that scripture again for next week? Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 3.23. Okay. Okay. Moses, if you recall, I always like to reflect on the fact that when the Lord stopped him on the mountain tending his sheep and he was there talking to the burning bush and the Lord said, I want you to go to Pharaoh and free the uh, Israelites from slavery. And Moses said, right. Absolutely. You got the right guy. I'm ready for the mission. Let's go. Is that what he said? No. Not at all. What did he do? No, 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 no. It ain't me. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, Michael. <laughs> you got the wrong guy. <laughs> he said, I stutter. I'm slow of tongue. I cannot go to Pharaoh. I'm a wanted murderer. Okay, you got the wrong guy. Forget about it. And ultimately, the Lord said, you go. I will be the words in your mouth. I am going to be your puppeteer. Okay, not only that, I'm going to take your brother and send him with you, and he can speak for you as well. Okay, his brother being Aaron. 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 Aaron, who became the Cajon Hagadol. The what? What's the Cajon Hagadol? It must be the high priest. The high priest. Exactly. How that happened, I'm not really sure. Okay, <laughs> but be that as it may, Aaron got away with some serious stuff. Okay, let's jump. Let's jump in our books. And again, if you don't have the book, okay, uh, Alethea, if you want to provide even in, even in, <clears throat> excuse me in the chat your email address so that we can get make sure that you get materials we'll have it yes. sent to you thank you thank you you're very welcome glad you're with us okay. Michael me too I'm grateful okay we are in a session called United. Okay, this is session three in our book. Uh, this is Acts 2, starting with verse 41. Running from 41 to 47. Okay, it's called United. Having to do with the unity of believers. And there's an, a memory verse here. And the memory verse... Um, if you'd like to read, um, Sheila, are you with us? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Acts 2, verse 42. Acts 2, verse 42. 27, 42. Okay. New covenant community begins. They were devoting themselves to the teaching of the emissaries and to fellowship, to breaking bread and to prayers. Fear lay upon. That, that, that's all. Okay. Okay. And who are the emissaries? Disciples. Followers. Yeah, the disciples, the apostles. Mm -hmm. Okay. The emissaries. Okay. All right. So. Uh, believers are united through a shared commitment to Yeshua. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. We're not all on the same page. We're all in agreement. All of us have different backgrounds, different places of worship. Okay? That's what makes Beth Yeshua kind of wonderful. Uh, a lot of people who may watch this after the fact or watch it on YouTube, um, don't understand that messianic synagogues are made up of people from every imaginable background and not much more than 15% of the people who attend are Jewish. But what we do there is we worship as they did 2,000 years ago. And we 
take the word of God literally, okay, not putting in our own rules, but we follow the word of God and what it says, and it is a joyous occasion when we are all unified in the same page and we enjoy each other's diversity, okay, everything that we do, the backgrounds, black, white, green, purple, chartreuse, doesn't matter what we are, where you're from, okay, we just don't celebrate what you did in the past, but we help you look forward to the future and a relationship with Yeshua the Messiah. Okay, so believers and the unity of believers uh, are unique, and they are what makes places of worship uh, unusual. Of course, various groups throughout history have created societies for support and various cooperation. But at its core, the community of faith is very different. While all humans are communal creatures and need contact with other people, the work and the ministry of the body of believers is based solely on the unique and finished work of Messiah. Amen. Fellowship consistently and constantly encourages others to seek him. Okay, that's what happened to me. Again, I was around other people who were believers, okay, and I liked where they were spiritually, which caused me to want to inquire and explore further and ultimately read what I had never read before, which was the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant. Okay, and thanks to Paul, who shared with the Gentiles to provoke the Jew to jealousy, I got provoked. And here I sit. Anyway, but as we work through this session and key passages here, consider why, why you fellowship with other believers at your local body, wherever you worship. Challenge yourself to examine your motives and filter them through Messiah. And pray that God shapes you into a leader who first and foremost points people to Yeshua. We need to chew on that for a minute. At the same time, pray that our group will grasp the importance of their connections in the body and will strive to nurture unity fellowship, and service for the glory of Adonai. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Alethea, if you hear anything that's unusual, that's not clear, please don't hesitate to ask. Okay? I'll ask. Thank you so much. Welcome so much. Glad you're here. Thank you. Okay. Me too. So, speaking of Olympics, Okay. Been some really good stuff and some really not so good stuff. But in, in nearly every sport, you can find teams that exceed expectations. They may lack a superstar athlete, but together they excel. And players on exceptional teams unselfishly perform the good of the whole team. Teams can fall apart if personal achievement becomes more important than the goals of the group. And what is true in sports applies even more to houses of worship. Unity impacts fulfillment of its mission. Unity impacts the fulfillment of the mission. That's why so many sometimes churches break off and and go off and split in a million different directions. Again, I know having traveled through, just by way of example, it's not just there, but spending time where my sister lives in up in North Carolina, that there's a church on every corner. And you're welcome to go. Yep. Once. <laughs> because they're all formed because somebody said, I don't agree with this or I don't agree with that. We're going to split off and form our own church. Okay, and they have their own ideas. Rather than looking at the word of God, okay, and being unified in the nature of all of that, okay, they split up. 
Question. Okay, Sheila. Sheila. Okay. So. What is Wayne okay? Sheila, you need to mute. Okay, sorry. Daughter. <laughs> okay. Okay. Not where, the only one. <laughs> where do I go? Where are we? <laughs> okay. So the question here is, okay, how does where you worship influence your choices for worship and ministry? With so much diversity, how can believers find common ground in unity? And again, where we are, the the, the unity is, is joyous. And again, there are people from every imaginable background. Okay, and it is just, it's a love fest. Okay, Beth Yeshua is, again, like most Messianic synagogues, only 15% of attendees there are Jewish, okay, that's a global fact, okay? But we have people from everywhere. And again, look at this class or look at my Totally Tasty Torah class on Saturday morning, okay? But we have people from every imaginable background and kind of spiritual experiences. But we come together to worship a living, loving God and take it, the word of God, literally. Acts 2 here, uh, shares how the church came into being. Okay. Rather than being the brainstorm of some human, the church, or I say, say that parenthetically, the place of worship was established by the purpose of God, Adonai, the promise of Messiah, and the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. This was a new day, a new day for those who are following God. And for example, okay, one sec. Okay, let me let me pick up on that again. One second, uh, Pastor. You said our side is more about monetizing the church and unifying the church. It also about competing on uh, who can have mega churches and buildings at the expense of the poor. The focus has been totally moved from the heart of the Father to self-serving. I'm sorry. And that's what does happen in a lot of places. Okay, one of the biggest uh, television ministries in the entire country here is led by a pastor he has a huge on-site congregation. I mean, thousands and thousands of people multiple times a day on Sunday. Okay, He has a huge television audience, and he tells his people, forget about the Old Testament. You don't need it anymore. It's worthless. You've got Jesus. Everything else before that is a waste of time. Pray for him. I have not listened to him enough to know that. So, <laughs> very sad. No, yeah. Very I don't think that. he needs to 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 he needs salvation himself. He does, but that's a slap in the face to the one who wrote the book. If you believe in a triune God, okay, Echad, Elohim. Okay, those are words for, okay, the first line of the Bible. It's also a slap in the face. It's a slap in the for face the to earthly. the one who wrote it. It's also a slap in the face to his earthly father, who, who did not believe that. Oh, you're this, talking about this pastor. Yes. Yes. His father was also a profound teacher. And believed in the Old Testament. Probably rolling over in his grave. Yep. Okay. But in terms of, for example, when we compare these verses and how Adonai called people to himself in the Torah, we see both continuity and we see discontinuity. 
in terms of continuity, the people of God are created by the word of God. In Genesis 1, God creates the universe through the power of his words. In Genesis 3, though the human race fell into sin, but the curses of sin came with a reason to hope. This promise demonstrated God's unmatched power and authority while also setting the foundation for the rest of Scripture. In Genesis 6 and 7, the words of God again take uh, the good news. What's the good news? Besora. Besora, Michael. Good for you. You get an A. Okay, in Hebrew, Besora, good news. Okay, they, those that takes center stage as God instructed Noah to build an ark. Lord, what's an ark? Oh, anyway. Uh, in this case, God's word proved that he is in the business of saving lives. And I hear an amen. Amen. In Genesis 12, God's voice called Abraham out of a life of idolatry and promised to bless the whole world through his family. Abraham obeyed God's word, setting the stage for Messiah. So in both the Old Testament, okay, Genesis to Malachi, okay, is actually called Tanakh. Okay, Genesis to the first five books is Torah. So in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, the work of God is connected to the words of God. The work of God is connected to the words of God, especially his promises. Okay? So in terms of discontinuity, the leaders of the Torah often fell short, even the best of them. Whether we think Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Moses, Eli, Gideon, Samson, David, or Solomon, the pages of the Torah are filled with stories of individuals living out tension between faith and failure. In contrast, the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, people of God are led by a king who is both God and man. Wow. Yeshua never sinned. He never fell short. Everything he did on earth was perfect, and all of his words are light and life. And the one who comes to call the people of God in the New Testament is, was, and always will be perfect in all ways. Listen. God's people have always been formed by God's words. And the first thing that occurred to me was that in the process of him trying to get my attention, always from as far back as I can remember, is that when I heard the word of God, I, even in the synagogue, even when I was watching a movie, if there was somebody reciting scripture, it got my attention. From the very beginning, I, I don't know why. Had to be the Ruach. Had to have been somebody sit, hitting me upside the head saying, you who, I'm trying to get your attention. Okay? But always, didn't know why. Okay? All I knew was I was Jewish. For whatever that meant, and I really didn't comprehend what it means to be Jewish. By definition, to be Jewish means lover of the Lord God Almighty. But I was in the dark. Uh, the early church embraced the words of God as they began the mission of sharing good news with others. And at Pentecost, and what is Pentecost? Because that's what this is about. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, but long before it was Pentecost, it was something else. Didn't it have to do with the first fruits? It did, but yeah, the first fruits referred to the, the festival called Bikorim. And who was the first fruit? Amen? The word of life. The word of life. But again, there's another word 
that celebrates, in other words, once we said that Passover, uh, that from the second day of Passover on through what is now called Pentecost is a 50-day period. Remember we talked about the counting of the Omer? It's a 50, 49 days, seven weeks. But on the 50th day, it is what? Shavuot. Shavuot. Thank you, Pastor. Shavuot. There are three pilgrimage festivals where you're supposed to report to the place that God designates. Okay, one is Passover. One is what we just said, Shavuot. Okay, which not only is now what you regard as Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit, but Shavuot commemorates the giving of Ten Words on Sinai. Exactly. Happened the same day. Not the same year. Happened at the same day. Okay? So they are integrated. We celebrate them both together. Okay, Shavuot and Pentecost. 3,000 people accepted God's word through Peter. I always like that guy. Uh, after Pentecost, this core group then started living out their faith in a tangible way as they understood God's direction. They experienced unity in Messiah, which strengthened both their fellowship with one another and witness to the world. And as a result, Messiah continued to multiply their efforts and draw people into a relationship with him. And that's what it's all about. Amen. Amen. It has even got nothing to do with religion. Okay. We've talked about this many times. Lutheran, Baptist, Christ, Catholic, all of those things are man-made and doesn't say anything about that in Scripture. It talks about having a relationship with Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Okay. Let's read on. Okay. Acts 2.41. Who's got it? Okay, Sheila? Acts 2.41. Get to 41. Five, eight, 40, 41. So those who received his message were immersed, and that day about 3,000 souls were added. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, uh, they were immersed, or as the church knows it, baptized. Okay, we often refer to somebody named Yohanan. Yohanan the Immerser. Again, the church, again, for many people who don't realize that, Aletheia, perhaps you haven't discovered this, but scripture over the last couple of thousand years has gone to great lengths to de-Judaize what was always Jewish to begin with. Okay, and that is to say, pull away from everything that was initially Jewish. So even in, in Judaism, there is what's called a mikvah, where one is dunked to get cleansed. Okay, this is John the Baptist, or John the Presbyterian, however you want to look at him. Okay. But he was Yohanan the Immerser by name. That's what he did. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Okay, the people who heard Peter's message understood and accepted the information that he shared with them. Salvation is holistic transformation, not merely a mental agreement. Whoa, wrap your head around that, please. Salvation is, is holistic transformation, not merely a mental agreement. A lot of people say, oh, I'm a Christian. But many people just say that because they know they're not Jewish. And have no deep-seated understanding as to what it means to be a follower of Yeshua the Messiah. Jewish or Gentile or whatever. Okay, this whole concept was Jewish to begin with, and Yeshua was a Torah-observant 
rabbi. And that fact gets lost in the weeds a lot. Okay? Since responding to the gospel affects the entire person, it does have a mental or uh, or a logical component. But the key is the response, the commitment, and the acceptance of God's plan for salvation. That's a big mouthful here. Okay. Anybody want to comment on that? On the fact that it's holistic and not just, a, you know, because I know, again, and again, I, I refer to my experience, but I'm kneeling at the coffee table of Dr. Howard Morgan in Brooklyn, New York, about to receive Yeshua as Messiah. And in my head, I'm thinking, Lord, give my intellect permission to believe. Because Judaism is so much largely about intellectualism. It had nothing to do with that. It, had, it was a hard issue. Anybody want to comment on that or talk about your experience? With the, the salvation is actually the renewing, the the transformation of the mind. Correct. You it don't, you know, you don't realize everything that's going to happen and how your thinking is going to change and how your preferences are going to change. And you don't have any clue all that the Lord will do through you when you accept him. Because he does, he changes your outlook, your whole outlook. Everything. Okay. The people that you associate with. Yeah. Or now disassociate with. All right. I mean, clearly, I remember that Susan and I used to, we had dear friends, friends of mine since the third grade. But on weekends, we would always be with them. Okay. And then once I announced to them that we had taken in another member of the family, Yeshua the Messiah. Done. Pastor, one second, let me see what you wrote. Okay, God bless you. Yeshua was very much a Jewish rabbi, which is what got me interested in understanding his heritage. He never abolished the old covenant. Amen and amen and amen. Yeah, a lot of people get confused by that, and they think that with the advent of the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, and Yeshua on the cross, that the laws and everything that we're reading about now in Torah were nailed to the cross and they're gone because we have grace and the law disappeared. Wrong. Totally. They interact with each other. Without one, you don't have the other. Okay, amen. So, anybody else want to reflect on that? Okay. Again, baptized, immersed, was the step of obedience in a believer's life in baptism. Being baptized as a believer is the normal Brit Hadashah, the new covenant pattern throughout Acts. Faith precedes baptism. Baptism is a public profession of faith. Okay, The mere act of baptism does not save anyone. However, baptism is both a sign of God's covenant and a symbol of faith. It represents a public profession that an individual has joined the body of Messiah and has been embraced by the local congregation. And it symbolizes that believers have died to their old ways of living and have been raised by God to walk in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Can anybody remember being baptized? Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, Sheila? Yes. You Were you dunked? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and what, what went through your head when you came up out of that water? 
Oh, I did. actually, there wasn't anything right then and there, but the next morning, I seemed to have a sense that the Holy Spirit was within me. Amen. Amen. Pastor? Thank you, Rabbi. I was uh, raising my hand, uh, agreeing that I was uh, baptized in at a, in a river. In the river, yeah, yeah. I yeah, was back, back at the village. I was baptized in the kitchen sink. It was a very tight, very tight fit. Eh? I said I was baptized initially in the kitchen sink. It was a very tight fit. <laughs> but then, I'm trying to imagine that part. <laughs> yeah, imagine. Okay, I was sprinkled, but uh, my our friends uh, who initially introduced us to all of this took us home and did that. But ultimately, then uh, the pastor took us down to the ocean, and all four of us together, my wife and my two children. All four of us were baptized uh, in the ocean up in Rhode Island. Wow. So, yeah, I, I I remember coming up out of that water. It was it was uh, beyond beyond description, beyond description. So, the mere act of baptism doesn't save anyone. We said, but three thousand people got saved, Luke noted, and he is the author here, 3,000 people were part of this initial wave of conversions after Peter's sermon. That must have been one heck of a sermon. Okay, some scholars see the connection between the 3,000 in Acts 2 and the people that were killed for their idolatry in Exodus 32. Okay, where was that? What happened there? In Exodus 32, it was the golden calf. Exactly. Okay, the people who were, Moses was up on the mountain, and uh, they said, we need something that we can see, that we can worship, and they built this, took all the jewelry and gold and poured it into a, a vessel, and poof, out, out of the ground come this perfectly polished calf. Okay. And 3,000 people got swallowed up. Okay, as an educated physician who was familiar with the Torah, Luke could have drawn this contrast to emphasize God's faith, um, faithfulness in restoring his people. Regardless, the large number of new believers underscores the power of the Besorah, the good news, when presented with sincerity and with the backing of of the Ruach HaKodesh. Okay, again, you don't have to have gone to cemetery school, I mean seminary, in order to witness to somebody and tell somebody what God is doing in your life. You can just tell them, I am not the same. I have Yeshua the Messiah in my life. Okay, the Mashiach. And this is what has happened as a result of that. And I could only wish the same for you. Again, he will do things you said, and we talked about this yesterday in class, is during the Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper as it's known, which was actually a Passover dinner, okay, where communion was taken. It's the only place in Scripture where communion is done. It doesn't mean you can't take communion any other time, but it's, it's a good thing. But he said, when I leave you, I am going to send my advocate. And when I send my advocate, he is going to enable you to do things even far greater than what I do, do or did. Name one thing that he did. Everybody's very quiet. What kind of miracles did he perform? Name one. 
Healings. Like healings. Raise people heroes from the dead. And... Mm. So we, I mean, if you believe what he said, there's no reason to doubt. Okay, the thing that gets in the way of us being able to do that and putting into practice what he said was, in my mind, technology. We are so overwhelmed by the media and the way of the world that we that we don't spend enough time looking and doing and, and believing everything that he said we can do. Okay, speak the word of God. Speak the words of, of God. It will be absolutely extraordinary. And again, you've heard me say this, but there was a dear friend uh, who was Jewish, who married, uh, who wanted to marry a Gentile in the church that I was in at the time. Okay. And she said to me, she said, you have to share your faith with him because I can't marry him. We would be unequally yoked. And that's not a good thing. Okay, he was an Orthodox Jew, had lived on a kibbutz in Israel. But he could see about what was going on in the church that people were praying that a relationship with Messiah was alive. And it wasn't just by rote reading out of a prayer book. Okay, it was a relationship that was living and alive. Okay, and I shared with him, and bottom line is he came to faith quickly. It hit him like a ton of bricks. Ultimately, I got to perform their wedding. But he was so excited that he wanted to share his faith with other people. And so he became part of a group that was called Evangelism Explosion, where people learned how to share their faith. And they went out once a week to different people who had come to the church and uh, to visit them to, to say, hey, listen, we're, you know, you're, we're glad you came. Can I, you know, ultimately, the bottom line, to see if they could lead them to faith. And if they didn't, you know, however number of people that they visited, if they didn't visit anybody, they would stop by the beach, which was really close by, and they had questionnaires so that they could meet and talk with people on the beach. And then they would reassemble after the evening was over and talk about their experience. Well, on his way back, he stopped at the drugstore close by the church. And he walked into the drugstore. There was nobody there except one young kid at the cash register who only spoke Spanish. He was determined, my friend, to share his faith. He took the kid outside and in Spanish led the kid to the Lord on the sidewalk. My friend spoke no Spanish. Another miracle of God. Amen. He can do all things. Amen. Amen. I love that story. It's hard for me to hold it together every time I talk about it. Okay. Amen. Alisa, amen. So, we have direct access to the Mashiach the Holy Spirit, and as a result, we can read and interpret God's will personally with the Spirit's help. We can carry the Apostles' teaching in our hands and in our hearts. They didn't have it all written down in front of them. Everybody's got a copy. Now, we can use it. Other people can read it. Okay? The key word here is fellowship. And Luke used the Greek word koinonia. Koinonia, which involves more than simply meeting at the same place or same time. It emphasizes sharing life together and actively participating in the experience of others. Fellowship is possible because we have been united in Yeshua 
and our love for one another will demonstrate to the world that we belong to him. Amen. And by loving and caring for one another in a practical way, Yeshua followers nurture unity within the body, which produces true fellowship. And our unity also validates the difference Yeshua can make in a person's life as we share the gospel with the world. Wow. One of the things it talks about here is in verse 42, read 42, Sheila. Verse 42. Acts 242. Acts 242. They were devoting themselves to the teaching of the emissaries and to fellowship, to breaking bread and to prayers. Breaking of bread, sharing meals, nurtures fellowship. Okay, how often have you had people to your home or met with people elsewhere over a meal? Okay, have a chance to get to know people and to know what kinds of things and be able to discuss the things of God. Sharing meals, again, for, for the early believers, the breaking of bread likely involved at least two activities. First, believers were in the habit of literally eating meals together. And secondly, this phrase has been associated with the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, the ceremonial meal instituted by Yeshua, Jesus. Pesach, Passover. Okay, Alethea, just in case you're not aware, Passover is usually in April, March, uh, and um, this year we'll be doing it at the Jacaranda Country Club and Plantation. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Okay. It is the, Great. the singular most profound time to share Yeshua with non-believers, especially Jewish non-believers. Because when the Jews celebrate Passover, there's no Jesus. Wow. Okay. And it's all about him. Amen. Okay. It also talks in that verse about prayer. In addition to its personal practice, corporate prayer should be part of our life together as believers. And just as eating a meal together can emphasize following fellowship, prayer also brings people together. When we share our prayer needs with one another, rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep, we help carry the burdens of life. I hear an amen. Amen. All right. Last couple of verses here. Okay. Oh. Verse okay. 43, verse 43. Yes. Fear lay upon each soul, and many wonders and signs were happening through the emissaries. Okay. Fear, awe, sometimes referred to. The Greek word phobos can also be rendered as fear. Have you heard phobia? Phobos mm -hmm. okay. can also be rendered as fear or panic. However, Luke used it to describe reverence or respect for God's work in the early body. In a world where information and explanations are at our fingertips and everything everything and things move at such a rapid pace, it can be easily uh, it can be easy to lose our sense and our awe. Okay, again what we were just talking about, we were bombarded with so many things above and beyond from the world. Okay, just like the power to run on an appliance does not actually come from the outlets power to perform signs and wonders did not originate with the apostles. They only accomplished what God empowered them to do. Okay, verse 44. And all who believed were together having everything in common. Okay, together, being physically present with one another is an essential part of the believer's fellowship. When a member or a person's body gets separated from the rest of the body, it's rather an important medical emergency and a cause for alarm. Immediate action is taken to make sure the separated member isn't permanently lost. Okay. In a similar way, an individual believer who gets separated from the body of Messiah is in great danger and should be reunited to the body as quickly as possible. Amen. A good analogy. It says, all things in common. The passage is descriptive. 
was it's descriptive and not prescriptive. The decision to sell one's property for the benefit of another is a personal choice, not a requirement of faith. Though some may follow this example, their decision should come from a conviction directed by the Lord and motivated by generosity, not obligation or coercion. Okay. Yeah. The attitude of selflessness should be a mark of the believer. And since God owns everything, we are simply stewards of his resources. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? And he owns the hills. We are simply stewards of his resources. As a result, we should hold all things with an open hand, recognizing that everything that we actually belong, that we have belongs to him and is a gift from him to us to use for his glory. One of the key doctrines talked about here is the church or the synagogue, the place of worship. Yeshua the Messiah is an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers within this place of worship, associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing, observing the two ordinances of Messiah governed by his laws, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. 45, Sheila. They began selling their property and possessions and sharing them with all as any had need. Oh. You ready to do that? <laughs> okay. Hmm. Selling their property yes. and spared them. Okay, one, you know, did, did, they distributed the proceeds. One, Rit Hadashah, the New Testament metaphor for body, is this family of God. Family of God. As we think about how generous we should be with fellow members, we should keep this metaphor in mind, family of God. Fellow Yeshua followers are brothers and sisters, and the way we care for one another affects our testimony before the watching world. You are aware that if you are a pronounced believer, that so many people are watching you, getting, waiting for you to trip up somewhere. Yesterday, Rabbi Adrian did a whole sermon about David, King David. King David, like Yeshua, was perfect, right? <laughs> Wrong. Definitely not. Definitely not. He was a murderer. He was an adulterer. But what did he do, ultimately? He repented. He repented. Okay. God chose him as a man who walks with the Lord. But did, were there consequences to his sin? The son died. His son, Absalom, was killed. That was the son that he had with, with who? What was her name? David and... Oh, Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Okay, so... The members of the early body stood out from the rest of the world through their willingness to look after each other, especially the least of these. Resources were something to promote unity by reliving, relieving, excuse me, suffering instead of something that could divide believers by social class. We have a profound ministry within the synagogue. 
Sheila, do you remember what they're called? Uh, Alicia and company that go out and they minister to the homeless? Yes. Yeah. What, what, are they, what do they call themselves? Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, I, I just can't think of it. That's it. No. Uh, oh, I can't remember. I can't think of it all of a sudden. Just mental break. In any case, we have a group that at least once a month goes out, takes food, Bibles, yes. tracks, okay, and goes out and ministers to people who are homeless, lead people to faith. Okay, it's profound ministry. Profound ministry. That's what we're at, asked to do. The Church of Acts 2, verse 45, we are re- reading out of Deuteronomy. Hang on one second. I right, read that. 1511, those who have more than enough must share with those without. There must be equitable sharing of wealth. Amen. Amen. Questions, subtractions, deletions. Okay. There's one last section here. Wow. Wow. Okay, verse 46. Day by day, they continued with one mind, spending time at the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were sharing together, eating together. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sheila. I interrupted. Okay. They were sharing. Go on. They were sharing meals with gladness and sincerity of heart. Amen. Amen. Okay. Day by day, devoted themselves with one mind with one mind, together in the temple. And they broke bread from house to house. They shared with gladness and sincere hearts, meeting together just as the body members were devoted to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, shared meals and prayer. They were also committed in meeting together. In fact, they met every day of the week. Fellowship and unity required intentionality. Believers cannot stumble passively into fellowship with the Spirit's help. We experience uh, benefits of coming together for regular Bible study and worship. Okay, it says in the temple, the temple was still the the, the uh, logical meeting place for the early believers. They understood that Yeshua was the fulfillment of the Old Testament of Torah prophecy okay, and sacrifices to their trips were intended, so their trips were intended to continue the Old Testament practices, and they focused on prayer and witnessing. Again, Yeshua was prophesied from the beginning. From the beginning. It was some that came along that broke up in that, but even Moses said, Behold, the timing is coming when I will raise up a prophet from amongst thy brethren. You must listen to him. And I will take my word and put it in his mouth, and he will teach my people all that I command. Moses, not Peter. Okay. In addition, the temple offered plenty of space for believers to gather. There's a key place here, a phrase, house to house. They went house to house, God's property. Everything they had was God's property. In contemporary culture, we often treat our homes as castles, as places of refuge to escape the, the, from the world. As acts, though, in acts, though the believers opened their houses to one another, something we don't do often enough. Homes were not only places for existing believers to meet with one another, but they were also places of evangelism where unbelievers became new believers. Amen? Mm-hmm. It talks about with gladness, and the Greek word here uses suggests intense emotion or exuberance. And the early followers of Yeshua were ecstatic to fellowship with one another. Ecstatic. What a wonderful word. 47 says that they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Praising God, one result of the joyful and sincere hearts of the early believers, was an acknowledgment of God who had brought them together. Believers held one another accountable and fostered the spirit of celebration by sharing their stories of faith with each other. 
What do we do when we first meet? We always talk about what? What's the first thing I say during all of my meetings? I ask if there's been any God sightings. God sightings. Okay. I didn't get that term. I didn't invent that. That was Dr. Henry Blackaby. Dear sweet man of God, may you rest in peace. Okay. Spirit of celebration by sharing their stories of faith with each other. We need to do that regularly. 47, Sheila. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord was adding to their number those being saved. So favor. Enjoying the favor. The way believers treated each other affected their witness for Yeshua in the world. Through their reputation for hospitality and brotherly love, they had favor even with non-believers opening the door for more witnessing opportunities. Earlier, Luke had used a form of the same Greek word called charis to describe the way Yeshua related to God and to others. While Messiah alone was the one to draw people into the church, the actions of his people made fellowship attractive. Paul said that our leaders must have a good reputation with those outside the walls of the church, indicating that this practice became normative. Normative. And the last thing it says in 47, 46 is that it, it added to their numbers. Added to their numbers. Every day, the Lord added to their numbers. As a result of the believers' unity and ministry, new believers were being added regularly. And when Yeshua is lifted up, he draws all people to himself. Amen. Amen. This was true on the cross, and it is true in how believers reflect him in the world. Hallelujah. the hell